First thing is, could you just each give us a two minute introduction of who you are, what you do, what your focus is, what you're been doing the last 10 years, um, and just give us a quick introduction so everyone could hear your voice and learn a little bit about what your main focus has been all these for the last 10 years. Any order, I guess, uh, uh, yeah, any order, just go in whatever order you, whoever's moved to speak can speak. I feel like we already got the introductions with the little thing. I think we should get to questions. I don't know what everybody else <laughs> sure. thinks. Okay, right to questions, okay. <laughs> All right. So the first question is, everyone in the country is speaking. Every health food store has someone that'll tell you about probiotics. Everyone sells enzymes. Everyone's got an opinion. Um, everyone, you know. So the question is, why should any, what is your basis for your information? Do you tell us what you, why you feel that the information, what is the source? Do you read articles? Do you get educated, you see patients, where does your source come from? So we could differentiate what you're saying than the 17 year old kid selling vitamins in, in the health food store. So what's the basis when you give us an opinion, what's it coming from? Please to each of you tell us that. Any order is fine. Just whoever was moved to speak, to speak out. For me, it's four words, peer reviewed medical literature. <laughs> Tell us more. How much do you read of that? Do you read one article a year? What I'm articles? missing, but what I'm missing is the clinical aspects that the other, um, uh, my other three panelists have that I don't have. I can tell you what the literature says, but I can't, I don't have the years of experience actually dealing with people. And so that's why this is such an amazing panel and can't wait to hear what everyone has to say. Michael, could you just repeat the phrase though about all the things that you read, you, you've said that you read every journal. Say what well, that phrase the, is. The, the, uh, well, the, the, I'm what does peer review mean? I'm currently working on a book on longevity. Um, it is uh, 80,000 uh, 80, papers from the literature. So that'll give you a sense. I've got 10 months to, for the, for the, to churn through those, so. Okay. But just one more time, just repeat the phrase you've said that you go through every draw. I want to hear that exactly. Well, on the day, on the years that I'm not writing a new book, I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, but there really aren't that many of them. Uh, just the nutrition journals. A lot of great nutritional science is published in internal medicine journals or cardiology journals. And uh, I only uh, happen to stumble across those if, uh, you know, a, a search on a particular topic pulls pull something up. So how many articles a year are you generally reviewing about? Lots. Over 100, over 1,000, over 10,000? Give us an idea. Uh, <laughs> I, I, tens of thousands of articles. Uh, but mostly I, I'm just scanning through table of contents to look for anything interesting rather than uh, reading uh, every single article. But I mean, some, some days I spend hours reading one article. Other days I can, you know, sift through dozens at a time. Got it. <laughs> Steve, can you ask Michael to explain to the lay people what peer reviewed means? That, oh, that's a that's a really good question. So, a peer reviewed scientific uh, literature means that you, uh, before it actually is published, um, your scientific peers, those who should have a sense of whether what you're not you're saying is total BS or not, get to review it. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I assume everyone here, uh, we have ourselves been peer reviewers for our peers. Um, mm -hmm. And so you read through an article before it ever gets out to the world. And you're like, wait a second, why did you do it this way? With the, the, you know, what you're saying isn't actually reflecting your data. Let's see the raw data, et cetera, et cetera. Now, is it a perfect system? By no means is it a perfect system, but it's the best we have. It's like what Winston Churchill said about democracy, worst possible system of governance, except for all the others. And it's the same thing, peer-reviewed scientific literature, worst way to do things, except for every other way. Um, and so this is what separates it from something you might see on the internet where anyone can just write anything crazy. At least there's a filter um, where just total craziness doesn't kind of get through, or at least you hope it doesn't. On the flip side of that, when I first, because I've, I've written two peer-reviewed uh, medical journal articles, but when I wrote my very first book, and I 
obviously triangulated data and it was really important to me to get all, you know, I read the hundreds and thousands of articles too and all that. And I couldn't believe that I submitted my manuscript and there wasn't anyone there reviewing for medical fact because it was an idiot's guide and it wasn't, we didn't even have references. So it was like, oh my gosh, I just published a book and you're relying on me to have done all the research. So it's quite interesting what is out there accessible. Mm -hmm. And I, I echo, uh, you know, Michael, of course, uh, we base what we say on evidence. And I can remember uh, when I decided to become plant-based myself, which was, um, what, about 32 years ago. And uh, at that time, um, I, I didn't know if there were any other vegetarian or vegan dietitians on the planet. Uh, I had never met another medical professional that was vegetarian or vegan. I had met one vegetarian in my whole life. I lived in Northern Ontario, which is really far from vegetarian. It's not exactly veg friendly territory. And I can remember thinking to myself, uh, if I'm going to do this, the only way I'm going to survive is to have all of my I's dotted and my T's crossed. And so I made uh, darn sure that I could back up everything I was saying. And, uh, and I've continued to do that because uh, the only way that this will really be mainstreamed, which is of course our goal, is uh, for you know, the, the hardcore medical and scientific world to be able to look at what we're saying and not see big holes in it. Uh, and so we need to be evidence-based in what we say. And that's, that's, I think, what we're all doing our very best to do. Of course, you know, but people will say, well, you, you know, uh, there's cherry picking in the plant-based world. Um, yes, there's cherry picking and whatever, whatever your passion is, we, I think, are all very passionate about animals and the environment and human health and and so, of course, um, we our radar is going to go to the studies that uh, that will will confirm um, our you know the association between these things. And uh, but I really have to say that I absolutely do not ignore uh, by any stretch of the imagination studies that are saying something contrary to what I would like them to be saying. Um, because I think we need to be uh, fully, uh, fully equipped to be able to respond to any of those kinds of claims. And, and of course, there are plenty of studies that show potential shortfalls in plant-based diets as well. And we need to be very aware of those because to me, uh, you know, our goal is to make sure that everybody that wants to do this uh, that wants to raise a family plant-based, that wants to eat plant-based, can succeed brilliantly. And I, I guess I'd like to just kind of build on what everyone has said so far um, about making sure that what we are uh, telling people and um, uh, delivering to them is something that they can trust. You know, as a practicing uh, physician, my first responsibility is to do no harm to people. And, and that is always um, foremost in my mind that I want to be able to, to tell someone something that they can trust. And, uh, and, and so it has to be based on science with a, a caveat. And I'll come back to that caveat. I, I, I like the way you introduced me, Steve, because you talked about the fact that I always try to present this information to people in a way that makes sense and that uh, helps them understand themselves and what we see in the world. Because if something is true, it will make sense. Um, uh, and what is just incontrovertible is that the reason we have the disciplines of, of biology and, and uh, uh uh, so uh, so forth, and we're able to to examine uh, the natural world and and sort of organize it is because nature, God, whoever you credit with uh, um, establishing uh, uh, living species, uses consistent design principles to meet 
you know, a, a particular problem. And, and there are absolutely anatomical, physiological features associated with particular types of diets. And human beings are plant eaters based on that. And then you say, okay, well, what happens when humans stick to a purely plant-based diet? Well, they live longer, they have fewer diseases, they don't end up looking like a leather purse by the time they're 35 years old. Um, they have less dementia. Um, they're more functional as they uh, um, uh, move through their lives. Their children um, uh, are, uh, uh, have fewer health problems. It, it, it shows that, that when human beings adhere to a plant-based diet, um, we're healthier, we live longer, we do better. And there are some missing pieces um, in our understanding of certain aspects of, of uh, our, how plant-based diets interface with our health and, and so forth. But, you know, one of, the, one of the expressions that's often used in medicine that I kind of despise is you'll ask a question or you'll make a statement about uh, the benefits of something and people say, well, there's no evidence for that. And what they mean by that is that there's no study somebody can uh, point to um, to establish, um, you know, the, 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 the principle or, or point you're trying to make. Well, that may be true, but the question is why? Um, and when it comes to plant-based eating, there's two major problems. As uh, Dr. Colin Campbell has pointed out time and time again, food is so complex. Uh, the, the the plants especially in terms of what they they uh, contain and and how these things interact that it's very difficult using the our current scientific methods to isolate some single factor to account for what we see because there's usually very complex uh, interplay uh, of 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 these the, these factors and then secondly traditional medical research has generally operated from the um, point of view of trying to develop a drug to resolve a problem. And as a result, they tend not to look at things that don't look promising for drug development. And so the reason we don't have quote unquote evidence for some things is simply because no one's looked at those issues from a plant-based perspective perspective before, but that doesn't mean that they're not true. And my glib way of framing this for people is I tell them no one has ever done a placebo-controlled double-blind study to prove that mothers love their children, but we know they do. So, um, you know, the scientific method is not always the only or even the best method for trying to access fundamental truths. 